All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's get started. So first of all, the third assignment is uh, released and is due again in 10-ish uh, days. Um, in this assignment, you are asked to implement a transformer, um, a simplified version of transformer without multi-headed self-attention, but with the single head uh, self-attention. Uh, and in the first part, you are going to try to predict a uh, very simple task of um, counting how many times a character had appeared in a given string. And then in the second part, you are actually going to implement neural language modeling with the transformer, uh, which is going to be kind of a core, as we have seen, a core for many things we do. So this will really kind of show you what it takes to do conditional text generation. Um, I want to note that you know, of course, you won't go about, you know, coding transformers all the time. There is a library where we can uh, load pre-trained uh, pre transformer models, and that also gives us code for fine-tuning them. And I'm going to demo that library. Today, we are going to go over how to do sentiment classification in the data set you have seen in the first two assignments uh, by fine-tuning a pre-trained BERT-like uh, language model. Are there any questions about the third homework? Yeah, I think this one, I mean, challenge. what's challenges is, is, is really subjective, but I do find it to be maybe slightly more intimidating than the others. Uh, I really recommend starting working on it early on. Uh, you can all do it as the same way you have done the first two assignments, uh, but you know, you're not gonna train just a, uh, feed forward neural network. Now you're working with the really uh, big machinery that's actually used um, uh, today, as we have seen. Uh, the second homework, we have noticed that a lot of you got that 10% 10, uh, 10 deduction because we flagged as you, if you didn't um, um, implement batch, batching, although you might have. So what we are gonna do this week is go through all such assignment, check whether we can see, find batching, and then uh, correct this deduction. Uh, and we plan to release the grades for the second homework by the end of this week. Um, if you struggle with the first or second assignment, please uh, reach out. I'm happy to have individual appointment with you and talk about like what, what, you know, what is hard, what doesn't seem to click, uh, or, you know, is the content the problem or coding? Um, I'm happy to, you know, just have a conversation with you and help you uh, in any uh, in any way uh, I can, uh, which is not, you know, uh, ignoring that homeworks have happened and that we do have these grades. Uh, so yeah, be proactive about reaching out to me if you want to chat with me. Uh, if you want to see solutions, talk to the uh, TAs or me during the office hours. If office hours don't work for you, we usually stick around a little bit after the lectures, or as I said, we are always happy to meet with you. Uh, meetings don't really work by sending up a Piazza, a Piazza message and asking, hey, can we meet now? Because we have our schedules as well. So if you would like to meet, like, let's say on Wednesday, it's good to reach out on Monday to find uh, a good time. Um, yeah, any any questions about homeworks? Yeah, and in this homework, you will, I, at some point I wrote uh, that you can use either self-attention, uh, like bidirectional or something else I said. Uh, I specified what that means, but basically bidirectional means you are looking at the entire input sequence, like you are allowing to look into the future. And with the other part, uh, with the other alternative, you do not allow to look into the future. I specified that description in the homework, but if it's unclear, reach out and we will clarify uh, anything uh, that needs to be. Okay, uh, cool. So. What we have talked about last time is that now we change our standard supervised deep learning paradigm from, you know, take randomly initialized neural network and training on the using the label data to let's first pre-train this model on uh, a huge corpus of text using objectives that don't require human labeling, such as next word prediction, which we call language modeling, or mask language modeling, where you randomly mask a token and then you uh, aim to predict um, what was in that place. And once you're done with this stage, which can take uh, a long time, you are going to uh, 
load those weights and then uh, fine tune the model with the label data, which is the exact same procedure we had before, except that now we don't start from randomly rather pre-trained weights of the model. And we have seen various examples of these models. Uh, we have seen GPT, uh, we have seen LAMA. These are decoder only uh, transformers that are pre-trained with language modeling. Uh, we have seen T5 encoder decoder transformer pre-chain, not only with language modeling, but also with a suite of supervised tasks, something we are going to talk more about today. And we have seen BERT-like models that are encoder-only transformers pre-trained with mask language modeling that are suitable for classification, but not really generation. Um, and what I want to do today is um, walk you through Hugging, Face's, uh, Hugging Face's ecosystem. So I never tried to demo any kind of notebooks before. So this is probably going to be a little bit uh, uh, rough. But if you have any questions, like please uh, stop and ask me. I suppose the first thing that would be useful is to make this screen larger. How how is this font size? People in the back, do you see this? All right, awesome. So uh, as I said in your homework, you are going to. Uh, actually implement transformers yourself, learn like really what it is. You know, it's one thing to listen to me going over the slide. The other thing is actually uh, to, you know, implement those layers yourself. Uh, however, in practice today, uh, either if you work in industry or you work in a startup or uh, as a researcher and you want to fine tune some pre-trained language models, you will uh, with 99% confidence use Hugging Faces ecosystem. So, First of all, Hugging Face, very funky name for such an important organization, uh, but it is an, a company that is developing these uh, open source libraries with the goal to have everyone, everyone training these models. So their goal is that we share as much as we can. And if we are, you know, having um, easier entrance to this field by, you know, like right now, if you want to fine tune a model, if you don't need to code all of these things, you will, fine tune the model more easily, right? And they have uh, a few libraries that are important. They started with the transformers in uh, about 2018 when BERT came out and when it was clear that this is a major breakthrough uh, in this space, um, they realized, okay, we need to have implementation of BERT that is more accessible to people. So they actually started as uh, not a transformers library, but rather like, pre-trained BERT, or I forget, like you wouldn't import transformers, but rather one of uh, this, uh, this other library. But then uh, it became clear that BERT is not going to be the only pre-trained language models, uh, language model. As we have seen, we changed from encoder only to decoder only, encoder, decoder. Um, so what they have then switched to is uh, producing this transformers library that covers all of these potential uh, uh, pre-trained language models. So description is that Hugging Faces Transformers provides APIs and tools to easily download and train state-of-the-art pre-trained models. After they've done that, they also realized, okay, now we have data sets. Um, everyone has their own way to you know, format the data set and uh, there isn't like this nice hub of where data sets appear. Wouldn't it be nicer that you have a website like their website where you uh, search for, um, for a name of a data set. For example, I have shared with you um, SST2, sentiment, uh, Stanf Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank. Uh, and now here you can see uh, under data sets, I have SST2. And indeed, that is my data set. Like you can read the data set card here. Data set card has been proposed. Uh, this idea of writing data set card has been proposed by various different researchers that we should document our data sets better. So you will typically find under Hugging Faces data sets the descriptions of the data, which is great. And what I love are these data set viewers where you can you know, inspect your data a little bit. So here you have sentences, you have labels uh, and so on. So you can look what's in data without actually ever downloading it and you formatting it and printing the uh, actual sentences and so on. So these are data sets. And then they were like, okay, now we have data sets, we have models. Evaluation uh, scripts are also very common. Why wouldn't we unify that as well? And then tokenizers as well. Like we have seen there are different ways to uh, learn tokenization from the data itself and they provide tokenizations. 
And you don't need to say, now go back to a research paper and think about, oh, what is the tokenizer that BERT had, people have used, uh, I need to implement it to be able to apply it to my own like new sentences, rather through using Hugging Faces ecosystem, they am giving the appropriate name for a model, it will retrieve the uh, trained, uh, uh, trained tokenizer uh, automatically. And all of this is part of Hugging Faces Hub. It's a, as they say in their own words, a platform uh, with over 350,000 models. I believe today uh, they, they've uh, reached like half a million, 75,000 data sets and uh, 500,000 uh, demo apps, uh, which they call spaces. Spaces are basically, you can think about ChatGPT kind of, you know, interface. They provide that kind of interface uh, with for for lots of models, and they're all open source and publicly uh, available, which is amazing. I mean, I can't describe you how major this is. You know, like a couple of years back, if you want to train a neural network, you had to implement all these layers. You had to find the data. Data was produced ages ago in some weird format. It took you ages to actually format it as something you can feed into neural network because data set. Uh, creators didn't have neural networks in mind when they were producing their data. So it would just take a lot to actually train a model. And today when I work with my PhD students, like they come um, and provide me a baseline results in a matter of a day with the latest models. And that's like way faster turnaround, which is, I guess, also why we have so many more papers today than we ever had before. So I want to go into how we can use um, hugging face to do uh, tokenization and you know training a model, evaluating the model. Uh, before I go into all of that, I want to see whether there are any questions from you at this point about hugging face. Okay, good. Seems like we are fine with hugging face. Um, and I want to emphasize this, that we do not have a homework for you where you need to find these, but Later on, when you are done with this course, I and mean, when you learn all these concepts through other homeworks, this is the kind of thing you will be doing. So it's up to you when you want to try it. I will share this with you when you want to try it on your own. I will probably next uh, on Wednesday also show you how to use sequence to sequence models. But um, it's really up to you whether you want to play around with this. But if you are thinking, is this work for me? This is, this is the, the kind of code you will be producing if you become an uh, NLPR. Um, after you graduate. Okay, so we do need uh, to pip install these uh, libraries. If we have transformers, we have data sets. These are these Hugging Faces libraries. And these other ones are just to uh, have dependencies, uh, right? Otherwise, uh, I get errors. Um, so if we do that, I already did that. So let's go farther. Yeah. I worked in a team with a guy who, like a principal engineer, who he gave gazillion talks of how we should not be using notebooks. So I'm so bad with notebooks. Um, so don't make fun of me in your heads. Okay, here. So um, we are we 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 download we installed data sets, the library I mentioned, and from data sets you can import this uh, function load data sets. And all you need to do to actually load the data set and get a so-called data set dictionary is to uh, have appropriate task name, which you can check as I shown you on the website. Like if you're not 100% what the uh, task's data sets name is, you go on data sets, uh, Hugging Faces website, and you kind of put some string that you think would be most likely the name of the data set and very often you will, you will find it. Um, so here we have SST2, and then all you do is load data set, um, give the data set name, and then you can specify whether you want a specific split or not. Um, so you can also, instead of specifying a split, you can load the entire data set. So here I have data set, and then I can uh, se uh, select a split as I, as I need it. So you have these two options, depends you know what you want to do later on. Um, so let's see, when I print data set, we have here a data set dictionary, uh, which consists of train validation and test. Each one of these is a data set, which has a feature index, sentence, and uh, label. And if I print a specific split, such as training split here, it's gonna be, of course, uh, this thing over here. Um, 
let me see whether. So um, if you would like to produce um, a specific example, uh, you can have, so we have loaded here, data set is a, a loaded data set. You can have data set equals train, uh, train that's gonna give me train split and then zero, let's put something else. I think the first example is not really nice. You get a dictionary like this. You get index of the sen of the example. You get the uh, actual sentence. That's the review. Uh, goes to absurd lengths and the label uh, zero, which means a negative sentiment label. Um, not always these key keys over here, like sentence and labels, are going to be the same. For example, if I have loaded another sentiment classification data set, IMDb, instead of sentence, I would have um, a key text. So these things change. And what you need to do is when you check the data set in Hugging Face uh, by just going to the, this uh, you know, website, you can check what are the expected keys or you can examine and, you know, programmatically what to expect here. Just don't expect that this is going to be a uh, universal key for every single text in the uh, data set. Okay, so far, things clear. All right, so I don't know how you feel about this, but this is way nicer than now, you know, downloading the files, putting them in appropriate place, writing a Python script to read the files line by line, uh, putting it in a, in, a, in a data structure where you will have uh, accessible, you know, the text of the review itself, the label and so on. It just makes you way faster. And here, this is just a little function to show a few examples. Basically what this does is, picks a random integer and then we, uh, you know, select uh, 10 uh, random examples from the uh, data set. We put it in a data frame and then we display it in this way. And then you can quickly get, you know, if you want to examine your data, you can use that data set, you know, viewer that we've seen before, but you can even programmatically quickly see a few examples, which is super, super nice. And I can't stress enough how important it is to look at the data, like always, before training a model, try to understand what kind of data are you working with. Um, and given that now you can do that so quickly, there is really no reason to at least read a few examples before you train a model. Okay, so now we loaded the data and what do we need to do next in terms of pre-processing if we want to put this into um, a transformer? Now we have text and labels, what is next? Nice. Tokenization, awesome. Yeah, that's the next thing we wanna do. Just a moment. All right, and we have talked about data-driven tokenization and maybe something I didn't mention last time is that when people pre-train language models, they also uh, are learning their own tokenizer. So when you have a pre-trained language model, it comes together with its tokenization. You can't just now use whatever tokenization you want because the first layer in a transformer is an embedding layer where each row corresponds to a token in vocabulary. It's not any token, it's a token in a vocabulary. So you need to work with the same vocabulary. So a nice thing about Hugging Face's uh, ecosystem is that all of these things are gonna work smoothly. So instead of needing to know what was the tokenizer that let's say the Berta people have used to uh, you know, train their model, um, you are going to use a class called auto tokenizer and uh, you are going to load the tokenizer just given the model's name again. So really simple. You don't really need to know um, exactly how it was trained or you don't need to implement it. You just need to uh, load this class and say uh, from this class, give me, give me the tokenizer. So we are going to do that. So from transformers from the library, we import auto tokenizer. We do need to know the model name. And this is sometimes slightly tricky just because organizations who have trained them will upload this on Hugging Face. So these models names will be under organization slash then the name. Again, um, if you go on the Hugging Faces hub uh, and you start writing the Bertha, uh, okay. Um, sorry guys, this is not what I wanted here. Um, here, the Berta, and then you see models. 
Um, you see that there are many of them here, but usually when people fine tune them on specific tasks and load them on hugging face, they will come with like the, na the name of the task or something extra. And here we see, okay, this seems the most canonical form. And I suspect that's the main one. And if you click on it, you're like, okay, yeah, this is the, the Berta model I was looking for. Uh, and then you can just click here, copy it to get the, uh, the actual name of the model. So you do that. Once you have your name of the model, then you from auto tokenizer, you load from pre-trained uh, the tokenizer of that model and you get your tokenizer. Super simple, right? Like you didn't really need to do much to get that tokenizer. Questions? Okay. Are we happy about this? Yeah, okay. Sorry, second? Yeah, it's, there isn't one Hugging Faces library. Uh, Hugging Faces organization that produces multiple libraries. Transformers is a library produced by Hugging Face. Yeah. Um, okay, now we have our tokenizer, and then you can do neat things like you can inspect the vocabulary by uh, checking what's the uh, vocab of the tokenizer. If we do that, oh, no, no, the tokenizer is not defined. I didn't do that. Okay, we are loading the tokenizer. Oh, this is all gonna take longer here. I feel like when we start training the model, it's gonna totally crash. Um, let me just check whether I have uh, used GPU. I did not, there you go. So let's do that. Let's go back. Okay. We definitely want to use a GPU. All right. Where did we stop? Okay, while this is working, um, I, I want to talk briefly about GPUs. Um, so collabs are one way to run some code with GPUs, but it really depends on availability of GPUs at the time. If you are in the school of computing, then you have access to the CHPC, which is our cluster with GPUs. Mm -hmm. It's very busy, uh, but you do get to eventually get in the queue. I will give you uh, instructions about how to get your jobs running on CHPC, which uh, you don't need to do for the class. But if you are imagining yourself ever training these models, especially for your projects later on, it's a great resource you want to make use of. Um, we have really good GPUs there. As I said, the, the waiting time is, um, you know, it takes a little bit to actually get your job in a queue, but you know, it's not like you're gonna publish a paper immediately. So you, you can afford to wait even a day if needed to be. Um, so yeah, I will send you instructions about how to use the CHPC. I will also make a class token for those who are not in School of Computing, then you can make an account on CHPC during the class duration. Uh, if you are in School of Computing, it makes more sense to not do it through class, but rather make your account because then when the class is over, you don't want your account to get killed for no reason, like you want to continue using it, right? So I will send you those instructions uh, for CHPC. All right, so we stop with the vocabulary. We've seen that. Uh, okay, uh, one thing I didn't tell you, so the length of this vocabulary of the Bertha model, which is one of these bert like models, but optimized, is uh, 128,000 tokens, which is way more than I have ever told you, and might, you might feel again, as I, as I uh, told you something that was wrong, um, vocabulary size of 30,000 is more frequent. So if we actually check uh, the vocabulary size of the bert base model, uh, we can see that it is uh, 30,522. Uh, so the Berta having such a huge vocabulary is specific to the Berta. Alrighty, so, okay. All right, so um, the way you are using the tokenizer and um, is by, you, you here we have defined tokenizer, just a moment. Oh God, this is so frustrating. <clears throat> uh, here, tokenizer is just the, uh, we're from the class auto tokenizer, we loaded the tokenizer from the model checkpoint. Um, you To tokenize a sentence, you just call that 
Um, let me do this. Okay, let me fix a few things because um, this there was a mistake. Alrighty, so um, here, to actually tokenize a sentence, you just call tokenizer on that sentence's string. That's all you do. And if you do that, for example, for this uh, review, the sweet Cinderella story, you will get um, a dictionary. And one of the keys in this dictionary is going to be input IDs. Input IDs all, almost always or always in the transformer library refer to the tokenized input that's then you know mapped to the corresponding integers so input ids are always going to be sequence of integers corresponding to indices in the vocabulary token type ids is something specific to bert i don't want to get into it it's not so important and attention mask is relevant if you are forbidding to look into the future some of these would be zero but here we are not forbidding that so here we have uh, all ones Okay, so we have our sentences tokenized. Uh, we can also, you can call the tokenizer on a list of uh, strings and it will work fine. Um, here, I'm just calling it on the list of 10 uh, examples. And then what you get in input IDs uh, value is the list of the list of integers. So this is very common uh, to actually apply this on, oh yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm intentionally not talking about it. It is uh, when BERT was released, uh, they had token embeddings, they had positional embeddings. They also introduced this token type embeddings to separate uh, sequences that come from you know different, uh, for example, if you want to do classification of two sequences, then they would use token type one for the first sentence and token type two for the other sentence to kind of give a signal to a model. These are two separate sentences. But actually, these days, it's not important anymore. And that's not what we really do. So here, if you have done that, and if you had like two sentence classification, this token type IDs, again, would be a list, but you would have like 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. If you had a third sentence, it would be 2, 2, 2, 2. And these models learn these embeddings for these token types as well. As I said, not really important for, for today's models. But yeah, I guess it's also good to know uh, about these things. Um, all righty, where did I stop? So yeah, um, we now need to tokenize our entire data set. And the way to do that is you just define pre-processing function uh, that uh, that uh, sets the, uh, you know, uh, that's going to tokenize your uh, sentence using the tokenizer. Uh, this truncation uh, here serves for, yeah, we wanna, if there, if there is, each one of these transformer model has maximum sequence length um, because the first operation we do is the linear transformation by multiplying with the matrix of the size d times n, where the n is maximum maximum sentence length or, uh, allowed. Uh, and you can't go above that. There is no way because your weights of your matrices are already exist and you can't now expand the number of columns your uh, matrices for the linear transformation in attention have. So you, if you have, you know, maximum sequence length of BERT-like models are 512, if I am not wrong, which means that if you have a sequence that's longer than that, then you need to truncate your sentence to that maximum size. Uh, if you have shorter sentences, you you pad them to the to the maximum size. Um, or you, yeah, you don't, yeah, you really pad. So. Um, yeah, this maximum sequence length is uh, today, we want to fit a lot of things into, into the input sequence, and I'll come to that, uh, which means that we want this ability to, to model really extremely long sequences. So currently, open source model will allow something to two to 4,000 input tokens, but then GPT-4 can, um, can take 32,000 tokens, which is still not enough for you know, processing a book, for example. Um, and this like, um, th there's kind of like a joke for a while, number of parameters of the model were really important. Like, you know, the bigger the model was, usually it was better, but today this, uh, the longer the input can be like the longer, the maximum input sequence length can be, 
that's kind of suggestive of like that's really advantageous in the model. So kind of okay, previously we the currency of good was number of parameters, but now the length of the context is is what matters. Um, okay, and here uh, batch means that we are gonna do batching later on. So this is just something specific to the to the library. And then all you do is you take your data set, the one you have loaded from the data sets library, and you map with this per process function. And what this is going to do is going to give you a, a data, again, a data set dictionary, which where each one of these sentences is already tokenized uh, into uh, the you know sequences we want to give to the transformer model. So it's also very nice. Like this is very small amount of code to write to actually take your entire data set and then tokenize it and produce a data structure where all the input sequences are tokenized and you can feed into the transformer. Yeah, it is very simple, right? Um, which is which is very nice. Like, yeah, I think not dealing with these kinds of things is, is great. You know, you want to do research, you don't want to write all this, you know, you code for loading and tokenizing and so on. Okay, things clear so far? Seems like it. So now we are gonna fine tune the model. And here a model of choice I, I have is uh, the Berta version three. As I said, it's a bird-like model, but it's way better than the original Berg. I recommend using it if you wanna do classification. Um, and uh, again, we don't need to now try to find the implementation of this model somewhere on, you know, from the original authors and try to combine it with the code we have. Rather, this implementation will be supported and implemented by, you know, Hugging Faces engineers already. And all we need is this uh, class, auto class, and say auto class dot from pre-train and give the model name. And it will going to load uh, the model uh, that, that we are uh, needing to, you know, its weights uh, and so on. Um, so yeah, that's what you do. So from transformers, um, you also need to um, define here. Um, so there is there is auto class, but there is auto class uh, auto classes for specific types of uh, problems you're going to work with, and you kind of need to kind of go into hugging face and find which one is the most appropriate for you. So uh, here there is a class auto model for sequence classification. We are doing sequence classification, seems like the most obvious choice for us. So we are going to use that class and from pre-trained to load our model. And all we need to do is specify how many classification labels uh, we have. Because remember with bird like models, we are adding these new parameters because we are erasing the output metrics that was used to you know, do mask language modeling. We don't care about that. We need new parameters for our classification. All right, so we do that. That's gonna load our model. Um, yeah, so, okay, I will tell you something else later on. Okay, that's loaded. And now the, the main class for training in Hugging Face is so-called the trainer class. Trainer class provides an app API for um, you know, training in PyTorch. And it supports all kinds of things uh, to actually you know, uh, instantiate a trainer. We will need two, two things. We will need the parameters of the trainer and we'll need our uh, evaluation metrics. So from Hugging Face, again, from Transformers, you're going to import these training arguments. And then you're going to define all sorts of things that now are hopefully more familiar to you, like a batch size and learning rate, um, number of training epochs, um, uh, and so on. So you, you are setting these uh, parameters. All right, you do that. Um, okay, I said here we are going to run this without GPUs. We can ignore that because we are running with GPUs. You also need to um, define your evaluation metric. We are going to use uh, accuracy. You need to write a function for computing the metric. Um, so that's one thing you do need to do. And, um, okay, I'm skipping this. And this is where uh, we are, you know, uh, defining our trainer. So this is, um, we, we load the trainer from the, uh, here, this will, okay, ignore this for a moment. 
Okay, again, from transformers, you load the trainer, you give it your model, you give it training arguments, your encoded tokenized training data, evaluation data. You do need to give it tokenizer again because trainer will do padding for you uh, and it needs to know which pad, uh, which index in the vocabulary pad token gets for given the tokenizer that was used and you need the measurements. So you do that. Now we have the model. Oh no. Encoded data set is not defined. Let's go back a little bit. All right. This is also pretty fast. I'm I'm happy about it. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have our trainer. And now to train your model, all you do is trainer.train. Super simple, right? No writing of the optimizer, nothing. Like no, you didn't even do batching, right? Everything is kind of taken care of for you. Hopefully this will work now. Okay, so um, it's gonna take a while. Uh, let's see whether we can change something, but you see how simple this now is to actually fine tune your model. You have uh, did the tokenization, you have loaded the tokenizer from the library, you have loaded the model, uh, and uh, now you needed to define the trainer just by specifying parameters like a batch size, learning rate, things like that. But once you have all of that, you just do trainer.train and you're fine tuning your model. Uh, which is, I would say, a uh, really, really easy way to do fine tuning, right? Okay, let's kill this. I will change the number of epochs to maybe one. And then we'll leave it in the background and we can come back to it. Did it crash? No, it didn't. Okay. I, I uh, killed I killed it. It didn't crash. Okay, so it's gonna take about thirty minutes. Um, okay, uh, we are going to see some sequence to sequence models uh, maybe next time. But I do want to kind of um, when you know students come to me and we work on a new problem and they're like, okay, I want to fine tune model, but it's not really BERT or classification. Like, where do I start? Uh, one easy. One way to go about that is to, you know, Google Hugging Face Transformer GitHub, and then you have their whole code base in GitHub. And under examples, PyTorch, you get code, a starting code for a bunch of tasks from, you know, they moved just from NLP, so they also have image and audio classification. But for example, if you have question answering or multiple choice question answering or uh, summarization, Whatever you you know what whatever task you have, the good way to find the bo like the first starting code is to find which task over here seems mo the most alike my task and how I want to approach it, and then uh you let's say you have summarization, basically you go into this code. The common thing to do is in this research in research is to copy paste this code, uh, including the header where it said that this is hugging faces code, and you change just the lines that you uh, you need to change, which are typically uh, the loading of the data set and potentially uh, the evaluation measurement if it's not the one you wanted. And that's how you get like a first baseline code for whatever you're doing. You run it, train it in the way I've shown you and you get the first results. So to actually find two models these days, you really have a lot of code uh, to, to start with. And although that idea might have Sounded a bit scary. It's really in practice, not not so hard. Okay, so I'm gonna leave this to train, and then we'll come back to it and see what had happened with it. Are there any questions about any of this? Yeah. For how much like research kind of stuff do you need a fleet of GPUs? Like if you wanted to just experiment and try things. Yeah, so, uh, you know, there are many things you do in research, so it really depends with what you are 
trying to do. Um, and it, it also depends on the sizes of models and whether you want to fine tune them or not. Like today we are going to talk about just avoiding fine tuning altogether. Um, if you are going to fine tune the model and you have lots of fine tuning examples and you are working on a size of, I can, I can give you may, maybe more concrete numbers. So if you are taking T5 model uh, of 11 billion uh, and you want to fine tune it with 100,000 examples, you are going to need to have uh, one node with eight GPUs of the size um, 40 gigabyte, a 100 with 40 gigabyte each, which is a lot, right? So, and we do have those on CHPC. So if you do need that, the waiting time for those kinds of resources is a bit, um, uh, you know, higher because you are trying to grab eight specific GPUs that are on the same node rather than spread apart, right? If you want to fine tune it on a single GPU, single A100, you will, 3 billion sometimes works if your input lengths are not huge. Um, and then for everything smaller, it is, uh, you know, um, GPU would just make everything faster. So you, you sometimes can do things on CPUs and wait for ages, and that's simply not, like turnaround in research would be too slow, especially for the things we are trying to do. So um, it's not like you always need to GPUs, especially if you're just trying things around and you can, you know, just see how things work on a small uh, sample. But if you are, you know, you, if you become a researcher, you you definitely use GPUs. Like you will never run code on CPUs. I think once you see how fast it is on GPU, you're like, no way I'm going to go back. Um, yeah, and then these days there are these quantization uh, approaches which uh, produce a smaller bit version of the model. So uh, now we have loaded um, this model in the 16 bit probably precision. I'm not sure what this default is, but I think it's 16 bit. And people have found ways to decrease the bit precision to 2%, oh, sorry, to two bits without, um, without losing the accuracy. Um, and that means that today, for example, we can use the quantized version of 70 billion model and fine tune it on a single uh, GPU. These things are have emerged last year, so they are a little bit buggy uh, and you might find you know, cases where things don't work really nicely for you. And I think there are still lots to explore, but the space is changing and you can do a lot with a single GPU. Yep. Uh -huh. To train a chat GPT, you need uh, hundreds of uh, GPUs. Um, yeah, and I don't know exact count, but I think Lama 2 paper had repeat, uh, had reported some values and it's it's enormous. Yeah, huge, huge, uh, huge clusters of GPUs. Uh, we don't have, like CHPC wouldn't be able. I think if we had access to the entirety of uh, CHPC, we still wouldn't be able to train one of these. But the, again, the, like ChatGPT, like uh, some other like bird-like model, you can pre-train. Uh, but ChatGPT is is really huge, I think. Yeah, yeah. So OpenAI said like last week they need seven trillion dollars. That's tri trigram doesn't even sound uh, reasonable. So. Uh, if they need that come amount of money, it's uh, you, it's it's for like new chips for being able to train these at the even larger scale. So yeah, it's a lot of a lot of compute, a lot of money going into into pre training. Yeah. Uh, do you think that we have like computational power we can like in the future more powerful than like more generation? Oh yeah. For sure, yeah. I mean, we definitely didn't uh, hit the point where pre like scaling things, um, you know, just resulted in diminishing res uh, returns, you know, like scaling and training for longer uh, or using more tokens for pre-training all are still giving better models. Um, but then there are capabilities that might not emerge us from the pre-training alone, which is uh, another another topic. Yes. Oh. Okay, so there are, I would break down your question into questions, how people choose hyperparameters for pre-training. 
and how people choose parameters for fine tuning of a very large model. The second one is easier, of course. Uh, and usually these days you are changing, training, changing the learning rate, the learning rate scheduler, which we didn't really talk about, but uh, in the beginning of training, we can have a little bit dynamic finding of the learning rate. Uh, it's not just static. And so you start with something small, for example, and linearly you increase it to some size is one example. Um, so we change that learning rate, learning rate scheduler and batch size. And yeah, something I didn't know, uh, mention when uh, when you asked about uh, how many GPUs we need. And when I said, okay, we can use one GPU, we can use one GPU, but the batch size is only one of size one, which is, as we learned, something that we don't really like. So something that's used is so-called gradient accumulation, where you are not, you, you have batch size of one or whatever, uh, and then you don't do the backprop every time after you're done with that batch, rather you do it after every gradient accumulation steps. So if gradient accumulation is four, only after seeing four batches, you are doing backprop but you are uh, averaging the gradients you have uh, seen after each batch. So accumulation is referring to your accumulating gradients, but only after that step you're doing back broker. And that's to simulate the batch size time gradient accumulation steps size. So if you had batch size of one and gradient accumulation of four, it's simulating batch size of four. Or if you have two and four, it simulates the batch size of eight. Uh, so these are uh, hyperparameters we typically change. So it's not really hard um, to find some that are reasonable and usually defaults for these models work well. Now for pre-training, it's a whole other game. And I haven't been part of the effort that, um, you know, of uh, part of a team that did pre-training. So I don't know how exactly it goes. Uh, but people I worked with before, they are uh, now have pre-trained one of these. And when we meet and chat, it seems really stressful, you know, because these experiments are extremely sparse and extremely expensive. Uh, I think there is a lot of um, networking and conversations among people who do this. And uh, I think they do some initial explorations, but at some point I think they just commit, you know, and it's in the trains, which sounds so scary. I, I can't even imagine. If you read the original GPT-3 paper, they have a section where they say we have trained on all the test sets, which is, I mean, unforgivable curse in ML. And they couldn't retrain the model, right? It costed like millions of dollars. So they just had to do some weird things to kind of show that it's still reasonable in the in research. Yeah. So yeah, you can't repeat the experiments. And I think there is a lot of babysitting going on. Like you look at the loss and there are these uh, effects where suddenly loss drops. That's called, called grokking. Um, so a lot of things. I will I will share you again, remind me because I always forget. Um, someone who have worked on the Hugging Faces engineering team, they have released like a online book for uh, engineering for large language models. So there, there are like things you need to be aware of if you would do some of these things, which I think is a, it's a great resource to check out because yeah, people will want you to know these things probably. Okay, other questions? Okay, then we are gonna leave this and come back to it, uh, but let's now go into other things we wanna talk about. So we have seen a pre-training fine tuning and we have basically come to the point, do I have this timeline? Yeah. Uh, so now we are coming to the 2022, uh, 2020, 2022 stage. So very recent uh, stuff. Um, and what has happened since basically 2020, uh, especially in the last two uh, years is that this pre-training stage has become much more involved. Specifically in 2020, instead of just having the next word prediction as our pre-training objective, people were said, well, we actually are going to use all the label data sets we have. So we have 18 hundreds of data sets available. And let's say, you know, they have, you know, thousand examples each that would make all, almost like 2 million labeled, human labeled examples for specific tasks. Let's use all of those and, you know, pre-train the model also with that. So let's let's uh, teach the model a bunch of these uh, tasks. 
And then in 2023, the last year, uh, uh, the idea of using human preferences of whether they prefer one generation over the other in terms of their usefulness and uh, you know um, safety uh, has been integrated into pre-training uh, as well. And everything happens in stages. So you always start with uh, next word prediction, long pre-training with that. That's now called base model. And then if you do instruct this uh, stage where you use this self, uh, these, um, these uh, supervised learning with this human label data, that's going to be called instruction fine tuning. And that's going to be instruct version of the model. And then if you do this final human feedback thing, that's going to be chat version of the model. So if you go to Hugging Face and, for example, you put Llama, you will see Llama base and Llama chat, uh, like these two uh, versions of the model, which we will we'll talk all about all of this, uh, just to give you kind of heads up of what we are going to talk about. All right, so let's get into it. Um, one thing I mentioned last time is that we use this um, BERT-like encoder-only models is that we ditch the output metrics and we add new parameters um, for our specific classification task. And then when we do fine tuning, we are actually changing the weights of the entire model, including this output metrics that we are lear learning from scratch. And, um, but, we don't really need to uh, really need to get rid of this output metrics. For example, if we had decoder only model, uh, this output metrics um, has been learned and we might make use of it, right? And the one way to make use of it is to say, well, um, you know, um, let's let's cast everything, every single task, no matter what type of a task it is, as sequence to sequence. Let's let's just generate uh, labels because. We have this output metrics and it can generate the token positive and that for us will indicate uh, it's a positive sentiment label. This, uh, this idea together with the idea that we want to make these models as general purpose as possible uh, and that we want to, you know, kind of uh, maybe give instructions to the model of a uh, type summarize had led to like a whole new wave of uh, language modeling. Um, namely, um, in uh, 2020, uh, GPT-3 was released, and that's when this idea of prompting has started, where you basically give as an input to a model a following sequence. Um, word prompt is overloaded, so I will use a prompt the way I use it. Prompt is a string that starts with an instruction. Here I'm giving you an example from uh, my own work on reading comprehension, which is a task where you need to um, you're given uh, some text like a paragraph, Wikipedia paragraph and a question about it and you need to answer the question with respect to the paragraph. That's called reading comprehension, a task we're going to talk about more. And we have developed this re specific reading comprehension task that involves models um, uh, to reason about implications of negation. So our instruction is, will be to the model, in this task, you are expected to write answers to questions involving reasoning about negation. The answer to the question should be yes, no, don't know, or a phrase in the passage. Questions can have only one correct answer. So it's basically, you, you find a very human-like way to instruct a model, like instructing another person. Uh, and, uh, you know, you might have heard about prompt engineering, which is uh, the idea of finding these ways of, uh, you know, instructing the model in a, in a nice way. So. Um, you might say, well, please, I'm begging you, you need to do this for me. And it has to be shown that for some reason now it might produce you a better answer. And which is really intellectually not nice, I would say. I mean, like, it, yeah, sure, you get improvements by finding these uh, prompts, but um, not understanding why exactly that phrasing had led to it is kind of um, not principle and displeasing in, in a research world. So you have the instruction. And then you give your task instance. As I said, our task instance is uh, has passage, it has a question, and then it has answer. Uh, and we, we just give this to the model. If this is unclear, this is all part of the same string. So if I had a variable, I don't know, prompt equals to, I would have quote marks, and then I would have these literal words and end up with a quote mark. Um, uh, these tags, passage semicolon, question semicolon, are very common in 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 a prompt. Again, if you are given 
this to a person, you also might delimitate this is a pro this is a passage and this is a question and so on. What you want, this is going to be input. This string is going to be input to your model. And you want your model to generate whatever is the answer. So you end up with answer semicolon. That's the last thing that the model gets. And then the model needs to generate the answer as a conditional text generation model. So it's gonna, if it, if it produced the right answer here, it's just gonna produce the word no, because that's the right answer here. This whole thing is what I call prompt. When you have the instruction, you have your example, and now we are gonna see more enhanced prompt where we add more information in this context. And very often the prompt will also be referred to as a context for the model. All right, questions about prompt? Yeah. Uh, encoder, decoder, or decoder. Yeah, if they were pre-trained with objectives where they can then generate next words, uh, then they will be suitable. So encoder only model, although you can find ways to prompt them, uh, and actually prompting had started with encoder only models, um, these days it's not very common. One way, for example, to prompt um, encoder models is to use that mask token. So your prompt to the model is a review, let's say, and then you say, this is a mask review and it needs to predict what the mask is. And then it, it might say like great or good or bad or terrible or something. And you'll find a way to map those tokens back to uh, the labels positive and negative. So that's how people have done it. Uh, but today it's really uncommon to do any prompting with uh, birth like models. Yeah. Um, Oops, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. We'll see now that we do do that. It hasn't, it's like in 2020 when GPT-3 has been produced, there were no training to do prompting. It's rather that ability that has emerged from the pre-training itself, from the doing the next word prediction, because, you know, um, we have all this text in the, in the, in the uh, on the web and the model had learned these associations between like, you know, someone might then say, oh, this is a summary. And then, you know, like learn that, oh, okay, this is, this is how, if someone mentions summary, this is how you would, you know, uh, generate next words. It learned these correlations. Uh, so we didn't do pre-training pre, pre with prompting before. This is something that had now become popular in 2022. And the, if you compare GPT-3 with, you know, any instruction fine tuning model, it's like really bad. It was very impressive at the, at the time just to, to be able to generate anything reasonable, like blew everyone's mind, right? But it was really bad at the same time. And only in, with these instruction fine tuning that we'll learn about in upcoming slides, things have been massively improved, yeah. Um, sorry, he was behind you. It was first, and then we come go. Uh, when you do, you give them the information to the model, like when you're training it, about how much it should know about this prompt already. Um, like, no. How does it? How does it know if it knows about it? Or I'm kind of getting at hallucination. Like, mm -hmm. Why would it? How could you limit that at all? When you're just doing a soft max and you're mm -hmm. Yeah. So the so uh, hallucination is the property just for those who don't know where the model generates facts that just just don't exist in the world or entities that are totally made up because it just spiraled or we maybe start the nucleus sampling to 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 high value and we're like boo be very creative. Um. So when we do prompting, we don't really. Uh, tell to the model like um, you know uh, what it knows about the problem and there are ways to go about hallucination of course uh, one of them is this uh, retrieval augmented generation I do have slide uh, for it where the idea is that you first find relevant documents in a big database you have uh, I like Google search you know like you have a m massive database and you find few documents that are most relevant to your to a given prompt. And then you do a generation that's conditional also on the retrieved documents, which minimizes the, you know, uh, the likelihood that the model will now start to talk about something that's not part of the context. But hallucination itself, it's still not fixed. 
I would, you know, it happens. I want to say it happens at the rates that, um, that are so scary. You know, um, there have been a study from Stanford where they have a bunch of uh, doctors using GPT-4 and they just wanted to see whether like what kind of outputs the model was giving. And then they said like 6% of the outputs were harmful because of the hallucination. And that is still, you know, if we talk about everyone using these tool, tools and we talk about a billion using billion users seeing these outputs and then 6% of a billion is still a lot, but um, it is not like the model constantly generates things that are made up. So, um, you know, I, I do believe it's a problem, but I find it to be a technical problem that's going to be solved. I'm not too pessimistic about it, but that's just me. So someone else might be different. Okay, so an example of a prompt. So one thing that's important to me to realize is that you, because I feel, feel like uh, other times I was teaching this, oh, these are two strings, okay. So um, I kind of just want to show you that, maybe I'll go here. So when I said this is one string, I mean it's really one string, and that means you have this, backslash and here and all of this, right? So that's your that's your prompt, okay? So you have all of these as a single single string. I, I want to send that message. All right, yep. Um, the prompts, can you see the more context the better on this? More context the better. Um, not necessarily. Um, depends what's in your context right like if you if you now make context super long but you didn't give the gist of what's needed you are confusing the model so it's not always more context is is better but very often there is a lot we want to give to the model so practically often more context is better but not you know just any any context yeah yeah yeah, exactly. So now I, okay, I have problems here with my uh, prompt, but uh, I put this prompt over here, uh, both the this part and this part together. So instruction and the task instance into a single string. That's our prompt. And I don't know how many tokens there are, but that would be the input length. And if it's more than 512, we would cut it. And that's bad because we don't want to cut it at the part where we have answer semicolon. Um, and yeah, so the context length really matters. And that's why, you know, when I said uh, that these days models are increasing the context length because that's the benefit, uh, you know, uh, benefit we want to have. Um, and it's going to become more obvious how, how context can be really, um, important like in context length is, is going to be uh, even more important in the next slide um, so in this example we are just giving instruction and one example this is also called zero shot learning because you are not giving uh, models any training examples whatsoever so this is going to also be referred to as uh, zero shot learning yes yeah so in the chat gpt like we saw so if the prompt is too large, it doesn't like it cuts it. So kind of on the previous history, it also like response. So yeah. can training be done in a similar fashion like on the yeah. three parts? So chat GPT takes 32,000 tokens, which is for most chats, we have, you're not going to be given like so a lot, unless you are really putting like common things like, not not gonna hit that thing. I don't know what exactly they do if you put now a huge book and then um I, I never tried it. It would be interesting to see. Like if you put a really ridiculously long input into chat GPT, would it throw an error or would it um not? And then they do oops, excuse me, they do need to do some kind of truncation in the background. There is no going beyond like once you have that maximum length fixed and you have a sequence that's longer than it you have to make it shorter but you know there are some people uh want to cut it in multiple you know truncated you can cut it in multiple chunks and then process chunks independently and then aggregate them somehow 
there are there is a whole line of work to deal with this uh, where the attention itself is modified like long former a model with the modified attention was doing that so there are all sorts of things people do to circumvent the context length problem yeah yeah if you want me to talk about any of this and we by the end of spring break we can kind of be freestyling about what we exactly want to talk about so uh, if you have some topics you would love me to talk about more, just put them on Piazza and I can, um, you know, talk about them more. Yep. So, sorry, I don't quite get, uh, uh, are you saying that there is no token limit or, oh, when the, when the model generates? Yeah, so... Models are trained to produce end of sequence token. So you, when you give an uh, instance to the model, you give training and uh, input and output example. Output example, output portion will end up with the end of sequence token, which means that the model will learn to eventually produce that token. And then we do post-processing step that, where as soon as we see that token, we stop the generation. Um, and we will not, like, no developer will show you that in the sequence token because that's rubbish. Why would we show it to you? But that's what happens. And so no generation is going on and on and on uh, indefinitely because the model had learned to produce the end of sequence token. Yeah. All righty. So this is our prompt. I'm going to see whether this has trained. Okay, so while I'm at this uh, little digression is that we trained our model and we achieved uh, by doing just a single pass over the data accuracy of 95%, almost 96. This is the same task you were working on with your logistic regression and uh, feed forward neural network where you had to achieve the accuracy of 17 something. So just with, uh, you know, you see how big of the jump we got just by using the pre-trained model uh, that's transformer based. Um, and this is, I don't know, I, I mean, we can try to see like, I forced it to go over the entire data, but I believe if we just did a few steps of the data, we would already hit a very high accuracy. Um, let me also quickly check uh, which size I use. <clears throat> yeah, this is a base version, which is only 40 million, 44 million uh, parameters, which is in the realm of pre-trained language models really, really low. So yeah, this is when I said pre-training was really effective. This is what I mean by it. Like you get this 20% improvements uh, very, very, very quickly. Okay, so this was our prompt, uh, example of prompt. And I will write here zero shot, just for you to remember also that term. Uh, because, um, You know, zero shot prompting in this way, where you just give instruction and um, and whatever example you have, it works sometimes. It doesn't work always, and um, and you know there are two things here. From one side, like machine learning people want to maybe improve the performance because zero shot is really hard. Uh, at the same time, this idea the you know, when GPT-3 was released and then when it was became clear that this might work to some extent, it opened this uh, a possibility of what really we want to do. And that's for lay people, people who don't know how to fine tune models, like using the code I have shown you in the beginning of the class today, they they don't know how to do that. They They don't know how to even access the model parameters, even if they had parameters available, they don't know how to fine tune them. But what they are able to do is provide examples of their task. And this idea, together with wanting to improve zero-shot performance, had then led to what we call in-context learning. Now, this looks scary, but it's not way more different than what we have seen before. We still have the same instruction in our prompt string. And we have, again, our evaluation, in, uh, our instance for which we want the answer for, but we don't know the answer yet. These things still are there. In between, however, we add a few examples from the training. Usually number is like eight or maybe 16, something small. And it again depends on how much you can fit in the context, right? So sometimes you just fit as much as you can. And very often, especially with reading comprehension, when you have this text, um, passage text, 
you can't fit a lot. So all you do is you sample a few of these from your training data and you put it inside of your uh, prompt. So now this prompt is again a string, uh, but it's longer and it includes a few examples that tell the model, listen, this is how you should be doing this task. This is what we expect from you. This is going to improve the performance. It's going to um, uh, prevent the model, if you want to do classification in this way, to generate tokens that are not in the label space, because it's going to see in our few examples that we have used constrained outputs, like yes, no, don't know. And it enables people who don't know how to fine tune models to actually be able to get a specialized like performance for, for what they want. This is called, so uh, examples we put in the prompt here are called examples or shots or demonstrations. And when you use a few examples or shots or demonstrations, we then you are doing few shot learning, uh, which is alternative to the zero shot we have seen. So zero and few always refer to number of training examples we have seen. Okay. Um, this, I'm kind of missing a slide here, and why? Uh, this is now called also in context learning, um, which some people don't like because there isn't really parameter changes here. Okay, I don't know why I'm missing a slide here. Uh, let me make a note. A uh, few shot learning in context learning. Yeah, so um, in context learning is just uh, a producing a prompt where you put the instruction, few example and evaluation example at the end. And importantly, you do not change the model parameters. There is no actual training here. You are not changing, you are not doing back propagation no more. You, all you are doing is inference with the model, but you are giving few examples. Um, few things. Uh, it has been shown that the choices um, here, you have maybe thousand evaluation examples and you want to do eight shot prompting. Um, you can't use for every single evaluation example, different eight shots, because then you're using more than eight, right? If we had every time we had constructed a prompt for our evaluation instance used different eight, we would actually use 8,000 training examples. So the number, you, you first sample eight from the training data, and then those are fixed, and then you put them inside uh, each evaluation instance prompt. However, it has been shown that the order of these matter. So sometimes you can hit a really good order and you say, oh, my few shot performance is really good. And then someone, oh, I'm gonna reproduce your your thing, and as we have all learned that random seeds and setting them is really difficult. They just have different, uh, you know, random seed, they, they use different order, and now they have a huge drop in performance. That has been repeatedly shown. So order matters, and the choice of those eight shots also matters. So sometimes you can find really good eight prompts and your performance is way higher than expected. So what people would do is they would, um, you sample, let's say, three sets of eight prompts, and they would repeat these experiments three times with three different choices of eight uh, examples, and then report the average accuracy at the end. Um, but yeah, the choice of prompts and, and so on, that's still ongoing area of research, how to, how to best design prompts, how to find the instructions automatically, and and so many things is something that's still actively researched. And uh, there, yeah, there are so many weird behaviors that are that are happening, um, which I should maybe show you a few. Um, in any case, a prompt engineering also involves finding these uh, best ways to prompt the model, like instruct the models. And one thing that has been shown to work uh, to for some tasks to uh, be, to lead to big improvements is so-called uh, chain of thought prompting or um, explain then predict. Here, what we change uh, relative to the previous prompt over here is really minor. Uh, if you see it, it is in uh, red color. Basically what we have done when we ask answer, 
uh, we don't just ask for the answer, but also for the reasoning behind the ex uh, the answer in plain language. So uh, here for our demonstrations or shots of examples, we say answer semicolon, and then let's think step by step. That's very important phrase. Then explanation for why the answer is going to be whatever the answer is going to be. Then so the answer is, and then the answer. Uh, so chain of thought prompting is just uh, prompting the model to generate its reasoning together with its answer. And you still do it in the same fashion we have done in context learning. Importantly, of course, you don't have for your evaluation instance explanation. So you just have answer, semicolon, let's think step by step, period. And then it will start generating some reasoning together with the answer. Um, and yeah, this has been massively important. People will still do this. However, you know, uh, all of this, expecting the model to do all of this really well, just by, you know, doing the next word prediction, it does it to some extent, but if we teach it to do this, all of these things is gonna do it way better. And that's what people kind of embraced in 2022. Uh, and this is a stage of pre-training after the next word prediction pre-training called instruction fine tuning. Uh, I would say the first major model that has done this is called Flanty5. They have used T5, which is pre-trained already. And then um, they use uh, the label data of 1800 tasks available from the NLP community. And they crafted these examples in a way that uh, we force the model to follow the instructions. So. If we have a summarization example, we will say summarize this this text and then give a, a you know a article and then output should be a human authored summary. Um, they so they included instructions inside of their input examples. Remember the demo I've shown you in the beginning. All we did is we take we have taken sentences and then tokenized it. Here we are doing something slightly different. We are first prepending the instruction to the sentence, right? And then tokenizing. So uh, that's what I mean by following instructions. And then we want the model to be able to do in-context learning, meaning giving few examples in the context also well. This is not something that just comes to every model like that. So uh, you also, instead of just giving a sentence, you give it instructions and then few examples and only then the sentence at the end. And uh, you also, for the for for data for which you have these explanations, you also do this let's think step-by-step -step explanation then answer thing to kind of uh, teach the model about, um, you know, that it should have the ability to produce explanations in plain English. You do all of that. I mean, uh, 18 hundreds of tasks is so, uh, it's, it's a lot, right? Like it's, uh, it's it's a huge amount of task, huge amount of data. So this step is really intensive, right? Uh, this is so much label data. So when people today tell you large language models have learned everything from scratch, be suspicious of that because now you know that, oh no, um, we have used label data of 1800 tasks. So if the model can do summarization, well, like, you know, like we have been training it to do summarization. It's not really that it appeared out of nowhere which uh, some people will uh, claim um, strongly. So we do that. Um, and then you have these instruction versions of the models, which work uh, work, work uh, way better. And today, every single uh, large language model has instruction fine tuning stage. So you start with the uh, next word prediction, and then you do this one, and that's going to be the instruct version of the model, usually way better than the uh, base version. Um, all right, I have gazillion things I want to say. So we'll continue chatting about this on Wednesday, and we are going to go into the human feedback stuff. If you have any specific things you would like me to talk more about, put them in Piazza, and I'll try to cover them uh, in the following weeks. All right, see you then.